Let me turn you down. Okay. Oh, what do we need to do? Am I on? I'm on. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to come down here only because I can't see from up there. Is that okay? My bike? I got to be up? Okay. All right. So I don't need to see anybody. Okay. But uh, I would like to know with a show of hands, how many of you interact with people who are different than you? How many of you interact with people from a different race? How many of you talk about race? And how many of you talk about race with people from a different race? Good. I'm glad to see that. Because too often we find that people believe in diversity, but there's not enough conversations with people from a different race. How many of you have ever found that you were uncomfortable talking about race with somebody from a different race? And how many of you have ever said something either inappropriate, offensive, or biased to somebody from a different race? You're, you're in good company, because I have too. Because at some point, every single one of us, no matter who you are, will either have said something or will say something to somebody from a different race that might be offensive, inappropriate, or biased. And when that happens, usually people do one of three things. They either stay and get really defensive, or they walk away and never have the conversation again, or they stay and learn. So what happens when people either stay and get defensive, because then they end up walking away, or they end up walking away, and then they never have that conversation again? What ends up happening in an organization is that there are unspoken tensions. And when there's unspoken tensions, it means that people are not talking to each other. And in general, I mean, okay, in general, one that usually happens, you have a, a, many organizations that you have where you come in and people talk about diversity. And so, say the organization, many times the organization is led by white people, not anything against white people, it just is what it is. And you have people of color who come into the organization. And a lot of times, a lot of the white people who, or anybody who are well-meaning, have good intentions, but they feel uncomfortable or they're afraid of saying something wrong, they don't want to be attacked, uh, they don't want to offend anybody. So what ends up happening is that they say nothing. And so you're a person of color, you're somebody who's different than the norm of the organization, and people aren't talking to you because they don't want to offend you. They don't want to hurt your feelings, they don't want to offend you. And you end up feeling like, what the heck am I doing here? I'm underutilized, I'm underappreciated, and I'm underrecognized. And then what happens? People leave. People leave. People don't want to stay somewhere where, they're not, where they don't really feel welcome. And oftentimes in organizations where people might be well-meaning, but they don't say anything because they want to hurt anybody's feelings, and they actually lose the genius that they could have had in their organization. I recently had an experience. I was recently asked to facilitate what I call an uncommon open dialogue with an African-American employee resource group from a Fortune 500 company in St. Louis, Missouri and Ferguson. Now, we know what happened in St. Louis and Ferguson, am I right? right. Okay. And immediately, after the last cop was found not guilty, the African-American people in the ERG went to work and nobody would talk to them. And what they said was happening was that there was a lot of white people were out there whispering, but nobody would say anything to them. And they said to me, we just wanted somebody to talk to. We wanted somebody to hear us. So we had an uncommon open dialogue with the African-American ERG, and we brought in the people who were the white allies. And for the first time, the people who were the white allies really sat 
and listened. And they heard what people had to say. They heard how people felt about, the, about, about what was going on in St. Louis, what was going on in Ferguson. One of the white allies had said, I always thought that I was an ally, but I never really thought about the responsibility that it took. I never really understood that I would have to take some action and I would have to speak up. So she was so impacted by it that she went and she talked to the CEO. The CEO was so impacted by what she had to say that he then invited the African American Employee Resource Group to lunch. And they talked, and they talked, and they talked. And as a result, they want to continue having these dialogues because somebody was willing to take a risk. The African American ERG was willing to take a risk and say, we need to have a conversation. And the white allies were willing to say, we need to have a conversation. And if we don't have these conversations and we just stay in a level of discomfort, then that's where we have unspoken tensions, discomfort, people not working together, and productivity is lost. In um, the next couple of minutes, I'm going to share with you three actions that you can take to help make uncomfortable conversations comfortable. And the first thing is to start out by taking a deep breath. And I mean take a, de take a deep breath and just step back for a second and just calm yourself down. And the second thing is to acknowledge. Acknowledge the fact that it's uncomfortable. Too often people don't want to acknowledge the fact that it's uncomfortable, so they're so uncomfortable with being uncomfortable, they don't do anything to make themselves comfortable. <laughs> so you have to start by acknowledging the discomfort. And once you acknowledge the discomfort, then it's easier to find connection with somebody. And then the third, the third action is to be able to find connection, to find one reason that you could connect with somebody who's very different than you. We, I, was doing some work with, um, I was doing some work with our local, with, with Muni. I forgot, I'm here in San Francisco where, where I live. Uh, we were doing some work with Muni, and there were some issues with some of the drivers, that people were in silos, and people weren't talking to each other. They didn't really know each other, but they needed to help each other. And what we did was we had an open dialogue. We had an uncommon open, open dialogue, and... We had people talk to each other. We had people answer these questions. One, what was your neighborhood like growing up in terms of diversity? Two, what messages did you get about people who were different growing up? Three, what was your first experience with somebody who was different? And four, what's your life like now in terms of diversity? So we had people share their stories. And oftentimes in the process of sharing stories, even though you might feel a little uncomfortable, people will find some commonality. In fact, at the end of one of the sessions, we had an African-American woman who was having some issues with a guy from El Salvador. And they found out that they were actually both single parents. And they had both been raised in single parent households. At the end of the conversation, the El Salvadorian guy says to the African-American woman, if I see you driving your bus and you're broken down, I'm going to stop and help you. Because in the past, he didn't help anybody. And she said, and when I see you, I'm going to smile and I'm going to say hello. Because she didn't smile at anybody. <laughs> and then we had another guy. We had, we had an African-American man from Texas who was like 65 years old. And he was talking to a young Vietnamese man who was like 25 years old. And they hadn't talked to each other before. At the end of the conversation, the African-American man says about the Vietnamese man, he said, I didn't know that Bao felt so alone and so lonely when he first came to the United States. That's exactly how I felt when I left Texas and I came here by myself. And the two of them bonded. And the two of them to this day are still friends. But if they had not been willing to take a risk, to make, to make an uncomfortable conversation comfortable. They wouldn't be talking. Who knows, they might not even be working together anymore. And what I'd like to say to you is if I've helped you just move just one millionth of a centimeter in your understanding, or if you're interested, or if you want to know more about how to use an open dialogue 
to be able to make uncomfortable conversations comfortable. Please give me your card, write your name down, hit me up on LinkedIn, and I'd love to share the process with you. And I'm just going to leave you with these, with these few words. And this is the model that I live my life by now when it comes to making uncomfortable conversations comfortable. Educate, don't annihilate. Thank you. <laughs>